Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Chrissy Kuhn with Mutual Inc, Chief Strategy Officer. Um, we're excited to be here to talk about how we're going to speed response um, when time matters most. And particularly, we're going to touch on the use of panic buttons and the reliance on panic buttons in emergency situations in, in our schools. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Attendees are in listen-only mode. Um, feel free to put any Q&A in the chat box and we'll be answering questions either live or we'll be sure to respond to them directly in those boxes. And um, there'll be two documents available at the end of this webinar. You'll have a, a handout that's a funding guide, particularly for the state of Texas, that will be available. And we also have a video that we'll be sharing with you as well. Um, so with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, Part of what has brought us here today is you know, the recent release of the DOJ after action report for the Uvalde situation. And 24 years post Columbine, we're still having a lot of the same issues that were echoed in the Columbine after action report and Parkland um, were echoed as well in Uvalde. Lack of coordination, non-existent communications, um, non-existent communications, misunderstanding of the situation at hand, um, the inability to communicate between schools, staff, and police, erroneous information going to families, um, over-reliance on radio communications, a lot of these same issues that have brought our law enforcement experts at Mutual Link together to have a really candid conversation about you know, the new role of school leaders the responsibilities now that are being put on school leaders for campus security and school safety, you know, beyond all of the other things that school school administrators now are having to deal with. And then also, you know, how, how we can step forward, learn from these failures that we see in these emergency situations and really take a step forward and get ahead of the curve instead of constantly playing catch up in these situations. So with that, I just want to go ahead and introduce those on our team today that are here with us today. We have Bonnie Rose, the Executive Director for the State of Texas. Um, we have Joe, Chief Joe Dooley, Director of Public Safety and Security Solutions. He's also a 41 year old law enforcement, excuse me, 41 year law enforcement veteran, a retired chief. Um, and then we have Corporal George Battle, also 31 years um, with Connecticut State Police. He's our Director of Public Safety Operations and Policy. Um, Greg Reyes, also a retired Chief of Police, but he is our Director of Public Safety Oper Operations. Actually, that is incorrect. That is not his title. Um, let me get you his right title. He is actually um, one of the customer success executives for the state of Texas works directly with Bonnie Rose. So I apologize for that error on there, but he is a 24 year law enforcement veteran and chief of police, retired chief of police. Um, Jeff Duran, executive director of technical solutions. He's going to assist us with our demonstration today. Also a 30 year veteran um, in law enforcement, but also considerable emergency management background along with Greg, who also has an emergency management background. So we're gonna have a very candid discussion as we get into this. A little bit about Mutual Link is, you know, we've been in this business for a long time. We're not just a new technology company that's, you know, emerged in the last year or two. We've been in business, you know, since 2006. And we were born out of the interoperability challenges of 9-11. And a lot of those, uh, those challenges still exist today. But we've evolved from a product company into, um, both a SaaS platform and really a technology solutions company. So we come to the table and we kind of play MacGyver of emergency communications. We come in and figure out what needs to be connected. We specialize in connecting systems to systems and we make sure that there's a common operating picture so that everyone who is involved in an incident, however small or however large, is getting the same information, has the ability com to communicate and can actually coordinate and collaborate in situations where lives are, are at stake and seconds matter most. Um, we have uh, um, over 4,000 schools and public safety agencies on our network as it stands now and over 10,000 plus users across the nation. Um, so we're here to talk a little bit today about 
about these issues that both we saw in Uvalde, but also, you know, again, how we can move forward from that. Our agenda, we're gonna have a moderated discussion. Um, we'll go into a demo of our automated emergency response system that really gives you as a school administrator, a school leader, you know, minutes back when you need them the most because it can automate a number of workflow tasks that um, can deliver the same communications and um, give first responders what they need in those situations so you can really focus on the safety and security of your staff and students and the families that are depending on you to keep those students safe. And then we're going to get to Q&A. So we're going to kind of blow through a lot of these slides so that we can get to the Q&A portion because that's the part that we really enjoy the most because we want to make this a collaborative discussion where we can discuss back and forth some of the challenges that you're having. Because what we found is, you know, when you, these emergencies are very local. So getting down into the weeds of what are the challenges that you're dealing with in your community is really where we specialize in both, you know, the solutions that we deliver, but also the customer service there to support it. So we're going to start. Um, I'm going to I'm going to call on Greg here for a second um, to kind of give us the lay of la lay of the land. I guess Greg and Bonnie, they're a Texas team. Would love to get a little bit of the lay of the land on, you know, new role for school leaders, um, some of the legislation and compliance issues that I think that I think they're faced with recently. Um, and just really get, you know, some some um, some lay of the land from both Bonnie and, and Greg around what's going on in Texas and what are these leaders challenged with now, in your opinion? Uh, so, honestly, the emergency operations plan requirement is it's relatively a new uh, area for schools. Uh, since 2019, they've had to uh, submit an emergency operations plan to the Texas School Safety Center for a review, uh, but honestly, it was a check mark. So if you submitted anything, you were in compliance. And and what we found was, as a state, that school districts were submitting their local emergency operations plan. So sometimes it had the city's name, county name, or sometimes they borrowed it from another school district and never even bothered to change the name on the emergency operations plan. So this proved to be an ineffective tool to handle an emergency in those situations. Uh, and honestly, it wasn't until uh, this last review cycle, 22-23 um, school year, uh, that the, the safety center actually did a deep dive and, and uh, ensured uh, specific compliance areas. Uh, and they, they had some time to uh, correct those issues and, and, and really focus on that, uh, those five phases of emergency management and that collaboration. Uh, but this year, uh, the school district should have already submitted their emergency operations plan uh, and uh, they've, they've made some changes there. So before we used to have 180 days to gain compliance, it was reviewed, it was submitted back to the uh, school district for, for changes and amendments and they had 180 days. Uh, to do that, that's been shortened down to 90 days. Um, that that's that's just one piece. And then here, uh, our Texas legislators have really done a phenomenal job uh, in collaborating with the Texas School Safety Center, and then creating this whole safety group with the Texas uh, Education uh, Agency uh, to to ensure that schools are actually safe. So they're using the same information that we're using, where they're using um, after action reporting and, and use case scenarios, best practices. So they're incorporating everything that needs to be considered for emergency operations tools. Um, but but there, there's a whole bunch of, of different things that are happening and they really follow the, the phases of emergency management that, have, that we've all have. Uh, from the training aspect, uh, uh, you know, after the Columbine uh, and, and to the hardening. So we just got past this, this hardening of our school facilities from exterior doors to, to labeling and numbering those doors for law enforcement response. Uh, collaboration, uh, part of that emergency operations thing was uh, you have to collaborate with your first responders. They have to do walkthroughs of your campus. They have to participate in the safety assessment of your campus. You have to communicate uh, 
those active threat situations and um, behavioral threat assessments that are being conducted within the school walls, now you have to share that information with your local first responders. Uh, they didn't really have to do that before. Uh, panic button solution, that, that was one of those uh, that, that was implemented. And that was, of course, uh, based off the Alyssa's law uh, from the Florida shooting. Uh, one of the victims there, there was a panic button solution uh, that's been implemented in every classroom. And they have till the end of this year, 2024, to be in compliance of there. But we, we've, we've seen those requirements from making sure we only have one point of entry at the campuses. Uh, to the labeling of the doors, uh, to new construction requirements. To, to If you're going to build a new school facility, it has to have a, a vestibule area where there's containment to the receptionist away from the school. So there's layers that they're trying to do. Fencing has been a, a big one. Window, window film. Uh, some of the exterior windows that are directly leading into the school have to be compliant with uh, uh, the safety measures of window film or uh, ballistic type of uh, levels of glass. Uh, so there's been a constant uh, flow and, and the Texas legislators have actually followed this uh, emergency operations error and phases that we've all done. But now uh, this last portion of it is to reinforce the uh, collaboration piece They've said sheriffs of every county with a population less than uh, 350,000 have to meet with their school districts and, and conduct a safety meeting. And part of that discussion is interoperability. How do we communicate during a crisis? And that's, an, that's a huge piece because I'm sure the panel, we've all seen the same topic come up over and over and over in every after action report. Uh, so that, that's one big piece is how are we going to communicate directly with law enforcement during the response? You know, it's so interesting, Greg, you touched on, there's so much to unpack oh. there. I, I mean, and from the law enforcement side, I think these are things that, you know, we have dealt with collectively in our 137 years of experience across law enforcement, but a lot of these are new responsibilities to put on school leaders. You know, historically, that expectation of I'm just going to call, call 911 and public safety is going to come and take care of this for me. I think that what what communities are realizing is that that isn't that isn't going to happen the way that I think historically you've thought that it would. And you know, those discussions are critical. Um, having those discussions ahead of time to get, you know, to build those relationships in advance of a situation happening. But, you know, I want to touch a little bit on um, one of the critical failures in Uvalde was those, you know, templated emergency operations plans. And while there were panic buttons in, in place there, you know, those templated uh, uh, emergency operations plans, um, while they checked the box, didn't really fit. Um, operationally to bring folks together to actually have a coordinated response. And that's some of what we're gonna talk about today. Bonnie, um, I'm not sure if you wanted to chime in a little bit about um, how that brings us to, you know, integrating your systems and connecting your systems into one tool that can then um, potentially be a life-saving tool for your community. Bonnie might be on mute. Bonnie, are you there? Bonnie, you're muted. Bonnie, I think you're muted. All right, Bonnie might be having just some trouble with her audio, um, but uh, you know, we can pitch the same question to Joe Dooley. Chief Dooley, if you wanted to chime in here, I think it's a good opportunity um, for you to join us. Um, yeah, I mean, this technology, I, I guess I can add to what Greg was saying before, um, how there's been so much that's occurred. And I think in recent history, we think of Columbine and then subsequent to that, uh, Virginia Tech for the, the higher ed experience. And as we talk about panic buttons, they're, they're helpful to alert the police. But unfortunately, what they're doing is they're just giving a signal that there's a problem 
but they're not actually saying what the problem is. And many of these systems uh, have little to no information. Some might give biographical information about the caller, uh, might give geographical information about the caller, but the disconnect is, is they really don't know what is going on uh, inside that school until the first responder, first one gets there and reports back. So, you know, this system, and we're we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit more about it, and then we're gonna do a demo on how this works. But when I I think of the we mentioned the years of experience on this call from law enforcement, um, the number of times responding uh, to an incident and not having any idea and constantly asking the dispatcher to tell us more and all they have is what the caller may have said and sometimes there's you can't understand them or there's no information so if you think of it in this perspective i always say information is power to be able to take a system that is a lot of money has been spent uh, on these school systems for camera systems um, and um, radio systems that security may use to be able to leverage all of that in a moment and bring it in, it's private until they're invited in. To bring that into an incident, to have it come back to the 911 center, the emergency operations center, wherever the police are monitoring it, and tell the first responders before they arrive what they're seeing so that they can focus on the proper area to come in. Uh, there have been many, a, a lot of money has been invested in this and school systems are required in, in, it's great to see the Texas legislature is forward leaning to make all these advancements. However, the tool or the, the phase of giving the first responders the tools to get in quickly, we saw this in, we've seen this in just about every instance that's happened in this country, but especially in Uvalde, they did not know what was going on. This system, the mutual link system and the technology drops into the 911 center and they can literally direct the responding officers and also those that are coming from different jurisdictions providing mutual aid can be brought into the instance so some everyone's working off the same platform or the same page you might say if you look at the slide that that's before you you have a push of a panic button it could be a wireless one it could be one on a, a phone or it could be a, a, a hardwired one on a wall gets activated then there's rules that get set into our system that the protocols get activated as to who gets notified. You can add additional law enforcement agencies or other first responders as needed. And then that response is truly coordinated versus the traditional approach, headquarters is waiting for the first responders to tell them what is actually going on to add more resources. Um, we have the next slide, uh, Chrissy. Yeah, Joe, I think um, you you definitely hit on quite a few of those. You know, we're going to talk a little bit. We're going to break down the technology a little bit and the tools that they should be looking at to connect. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit also about some funding that might be available to help them, you know, bridge these systems, right? We want them to be able to leverage the investments you've already made. Um, you know, we're partnered with all uh, all the panic button providers. You know, we're partners with the carriers, doesn't matter, you know, if it's FirstNet or T-Mobile or, or um, Verizon, you know, we're able to come in and connect the existing systems. And I think that is probably the most unique um, thing about our system is, is really it is the tool that fills that gap, to your point, um, that gives law enforcement that visibility that they need to see, but also gives, you know, the superintendents um, school, administ school administrators, district administrators, the tools that they need to also have visibility in what that law enforcement response looks like. So as we as we go in um, to the next few slides and talk about the technology and, and tools, Joe and, and Jeff's going to assist with the demo. Maybe we can talk a little bit about, you know, the visibility that that the school leaders get when they have access to these systems and the ability to see you know, what's happening, what, how far law enforcement's got, has medical been brought in, do we need to set up a triage? You know, Some of these really key components of your emergency operations plan that once you have those initial conversations, you'll understand the things that should be happening and also be able to recognize when things are definitely going wrong. So if, if I can just add to what you said, Chrissy, if you're looking at the slide we have now, 
making the assumption that the panic button had been pushed, you can see this dashboard that comes up that drops in uh, several cameras. It drops in a not just the regular floor plan that maybe exists with the school system, but a colorized floor plan. We do a color layover. All the hallways are yellow, unless the halls are painted in a certain color, we'll mirror that. But generally, we'll make them yellow. We'll make bright uh, royal blue numbers uh, in those rooms so they're easy to see. We remove a lot of the extraneous, possibly mechanicals, electricals that sometimes are on architectural drawings and make it clean and simple. And if you see those red icons on the map, all of the interior cameras are plotted right on that floor plan so that they're they're functional. You can click on those and, and go to the views. So you may see three, four cameras come up initially when the system's activated. If there were 100 cameras in that building, uh, you, you would be able to go from floor to floor with drop downs. And there's the other one is the uh, TX button allows to talk over the school's radio. So the police department or first responders that may have the app uh, or, or in the patrol cars could talk directly to school security or the ICOM channel is an intercom channel. And another, another important thing to remember is that this is not just a platform just for that one time and hopefully no time emergency that may happen, but this can be used for pre-planned events that are occurring at schools, whether it be commencements, large gatherings, sometimes town or city gatherings that the facilities are being used. You can create an incident, drop some cameras in and share that uh, at, in that moment with law enforcement so they can see what's going on. Hey, Joe, if I can add to that, uh, you know, talking from that Texas school emergency management perspective, if we're, if we're looking to check a few boxes, walkthroughs, we can do a digital walkthrough of our campus now because we have that capability of just creating an incident, inviting all these first responders, and you don't have to be familiar with this campus. You can do a virtual walkthrough now with this system. Uh, and, and even running a, a tactical operations from a command perspective, uh, it's, it's right there in front of you. We, we've all used Google Maps. We all are all familiar with some of these features and, and it's user friendly. So um, we were able to meet some of those requirements and be in compliance already with this system. I, I think it's amazing. That's a good point. Yeah, that's a great point, Greg and Joey. You know, you look at this and go, you know, with armed with this information, can we really expedite that response? Can we help inform, you know, not just officers, but the other stakeholders that are, you know, if it is a real incident, the other stakeholders that are going to need information, or if it's actually a false alarm, which we get a lot. Right? We probably get more often than the fact that it's a real incident is how quickly can we bring resolution to a false alarm so that you know we're not disrupting classrooms. Um, Greg or Joe, you know, do you guys want to talk a little bit about the different systems that we can connect with the school before we turn it over to Jeff Duran and he's actually going to give us a live view of it? Well, I, I can add in, Greg, if you want to jump in also. If you think about Quite a bit of money has been spent already in your school systems, either through your capital funding or through grants that have come out. Um, there have been recommendations over the years. Make sure that you have an intercom system that's working, a robust one. I'm sure everyone has increased from analog cameras to digital cameras. Um, there's been quite a bit of mass notification systems. Mutual Link can connect to those systems. Mutual Link doesn't come in and say, you're gonna to need to scrap your existing infrastructure. We leverage that right in and connect to it. And then from there, you can see from this diagram, it can go to various, uh, the first responders at the police department. It can go to actually the patrol cars, to the laptops that are in the cars. Um, it can go to other first responders that are managing these incidents. These critical incidents, you know, fire departments, paramedics, um, uh, others, other, others that are going to come in to mitigate the incident. At the end of the day, information is power, and it's all about speed to resolution. And I, I think anyone, uh, either in this 
webinar or anyone understanding uh, that having information before they enter the building is critical to a success and a well-coordinated effort. Absolutely. You know, one of our, our West Texas uh, school clients uh, is using Mutual Link every day. And I think it's amazing because uh, part of their bus transportation, uh, they have radios inside the bus. Um, but once they get to a certain point outside of the city, they no longer are able to transmit from that bus. Uh, and because of this location of this district, they are, they're constantly transporting kids to different <laughs> athletic events. And, you know, nothing in Texas is close. They're utilizing mutual link to communicate. So they could be miles and thousands of miles away and still have connectivity with that bus driver. Yeah, that's a great point, Greg. You know, we're doing that in Arizona as well, where, you know, 80% um, of the state of Arizona is on mutual link. And there are several schools where they actually use, um, use it on the buses to reroute buses and flash floods because they used to fax the routes out to the buses. Oh. And so they're able to just give devices, um, LTE devices to the buses, and then they're able to not only um, share new route information, but if they have situations where you may be a child's been left on the bus who can't communicate um, where he or she lives, they can snap a picture. It's FERPA and HIPAA compliant, able to reunite that child with his family, his or her family really quickly. So they found value in that as well as just it generally being a day-to-day -day communication system because it integrates the radios. Um, so with that, I think we're going to turn it over to Jeff Duran, and um, he's going to take us through a quick walkthrough of what this automated emergency response system looks like and how we bridge, you know, that single communications channel and sort of your worst case scenario type of an event. Jeff? Thank you, Chrissy. So simply stated, the number one goal here is MutualLink will allow us to leverage technology to provide the most amount of information possible to public safety and first responders in the shortest amount of time possible. And I'll just double check if everybody can see the screen. Good, thank you. A couple of things we need to say before you see this fast moving demonstration, uh, but we'll break it down uh, by components that you understand what's actually happening here. And it was mentioned by Chief Dooley that uh, the existing investments you've already made in, in critical infrastructure, such as surveillance cameras and radio technology and panic button technologies, is uh, completely protected. Uh, MutualLink is completely agnostic with regard to whatever you're already using. There's absolutely no need to go out and reinvestigate surveillance cameras and things of that sort. The radio system you have right now will work perfectly. And another thing I want to add is we talk a lot about this technology to push panic buttons, but it's important to note that nothing that I'll show you here today is ever meant to circumvent or otherwise interrupt our trusted 911 system. 911 has served us very well throughout this nation. For many years, we expect that to continue. If you see something, you say something, you do that by dialing 911, and your trained professional 911 telecommunicators will know exactly what to do. But what I'm going to show you is MutualLink Link 360. The solution does involve some hardware, some software that is installed generally on the campus. If you already have an existing panic button system, we can probably connect to it. I can say this, if you don't have a panic button system, MutualLink offers a very cost-effective panic solution that can support buttons or easily wearable fobs, devices you can put around your neck or otherwise push a button when you have an emergency. Very cost-effective solution that we call Link360 Touch. So ask us about that. When an emergency happens on campus, the first thing we have to do is somehow notify our public safety partners and our first responders that we need help and we need it now. But teachers, staff, administration are gonna be concentrating on life safety 
issues at that very moment. They're going to instinctively want to protect the children, their students, but somehow they have to be able to push a button or dial 911 to get help on the way. So what I'm going to show you now is a simulation of an actual emergency, but we're going to actually use a live network environment. And although I can't show you an actual school today, what I will be able to show you is a facility located in Washington, D.C. called the Capital One Arena. MutuLink is working in partner with the Department of Homeland Security to investigate and test advanced AI integrations into camera systems. It will allow us to demonstrate the functionality of the system. I'm going to simulate that emergency now. We'll step through an actual MutuLink Link 360 panic button scenario. And then we'll pause and we'll talk about what we just saw. What you see on the screen is an application that typically is running in the 911 PSAP center where that trained telecommunicator is waiting to get that incoming alert. It's also important to note that this very same application can be running in the superintendent's office, the principal's office, the school resource office. Those are all decided by the MutuLink customers and subscribers to the network. In other words, it's not just at the 911 center because what's important here is collaboration. And being able to do that in a real-time environment is what really uh, makes the difference. So uh, what we're gonna do here is simulate that emergency and we'll take you through what's actually happening. Pretend for a moment that I'm the 911 telecommunicator and somebody at the school has either pushed a panic button on the wall or they've activated a soft panic button that might actually be installed on a smartphone. The alert comes in to the 911 center. That 911 operator sees immediately which campus this emergency is coming from. They acknowledge the receipt of the incoming invitation. And within just a matter of seconds, that 911 operator, and to Chief Dooley's point, they see this colorful unified floor plan map. Now, I use the term unified because no matter how many schools might be in your district or how many districts you're servicing from the 911 perspective, the best thing you can do for the professionals is to give them a map that looks the same basically from campus to campus to campus. Of course, all that really changes are the names of the hallways and the names of the cameras and the layout of the building. Immediately what that 911 telecommunicator sees are cameras. And if the technology supports, you see cameras that are turned on in the vicinity to the best knowledge we have of where that button was pushed. Giving that first Jeff. response. Jeff, if I could just interrupt you for one quick second. We're, we're just seeing the network map and not the incident map with the building. Uh, I apologize for that. Let me. Um, we, we heard everything drop in, Jeff, but uh, not seeing anything other than that map. Yeah, it looks like a go to webinar issue. Yeah, there so let me, uh, let me stop sharing we, we, and we, back in. We, wow. we, are seeing it correct. we are seeing it correctly now, Jeff. Okay, so you're seeing the floor plan? Yes, we are. Oh, my, my sincerest apology. I don't know what went wrong there because I haven't changed anything on my end, so perhaps a webinar issue. I apologize for that. But what you should be seeing after the 911 telecommunicator received that alert, we went from that na nationwide map to a very localized map showing cameras on a floor plan and two camera views that might be relevant to where that panic button was pushed. The 911 telecommuter has the additional ability to click on any camera within the campus to perhaps follow a person of interest or to determine if in fact they're dealing with a false alarm, which could be entirely possible. Another important thing, this is not just about video. This is also about being able to communicate via two-way radio with school officials and other first responders because the MutuLink technology bridges in any radio system at all, regardless of whether it's the police encrypted radio or a school business band radio, uh, everybody can communicate immediately in the context of being able to get the maximum information to that first responder. So any transmission made on a radio is instantly heard, uh, not only by the, uh, not only by the people who have been invited or brought into this uh, incident but also by people who may be running this application on a smartphone, whether it's an iPhone or an Android phone. And once they're in there, they actually have the ability to then uh, go in and actually uh, look at and monitor cameras in real time. And at the same time, 
using the, the uh, communication capabilities of the application, they can talk over the radio system or they can access the intercom communications and have this instant collaboration between anybody on two-way radio, anybody on a smartphone application, turning this into a virtual walkie-talkie, a virtual command post in the palm of your hand, being able to see that video. Now we're gonna wrap up the demonstration because we don't wanna make it too technical or involved, but let me say this, something you may not have noticed when we first started and initiated this emergency. The 911 telecommunicator was not required to log into any specific camera system. They did not have to pull a binder off the shelf to type in a login or a password and then begin to figure out what cameras they're looking at. Mutulink handles all that through the automated response plan. That's very, very critical. This is all worked out beforehand. So in the event of the emergency, those cameras are shared instantly with the first responder with very little effort on their part. They're instantly watching this video. They're instantly hearing the radio comms and have the ability to communicate with everybody on campus to see what happens. We always think about the partnerships that exist between schools and the first responders. And I'm sure in your community, you have a great relationship with the police chief, the sheriff, state police, who's ever responsible for bringing help directly to you. But there are stakeholder questions with regard to the privacy of the camera systems. Mutualink makes this a very easy scenario because you remember the first responders and law enforcement could not see these cameras until you initiated the panic situation from your application or a button. Also, when the emergency concludes, the system can smartly and politely revoke and pull back the permission to view these cameras until the next time it becomes necessary to see what's going on inside that campus. So privacy is protected. This is important for parents, stakeholders, and boards of education. And quite frankly, and my law enforcement brothers will uh, echo this, and sisters, will echo that this is a very important part. They do not wish to have the liability of being able to look at your cameras at any time. And we've solved this issue nationwide in hundreds of schools. So with that, I'll pause and I'll throw it back to the group to see if there's anything in particular we might wanna cover. And I apologize for the snafu earlier. I hope you got the idea of what we needed to show. Chrissy? Yeah, thank you so much, Jeff. A couple of things that I would like to cover while we have um, this up on the screen, um, and you know, especially with all the law enforcement experience that we have on this call, you know, we painstakingly went through the Uvalde report because there's so many lessons to learn there. Um, in part of part of um, some of the critical fa failures that we identified, even that that this particular system addresses absolutely immediately, is at that initial onset of that pre the pressing of that button there's already a pre-scripted emergency protocol that we work hand in hand collaboratively with you your law enforcement partners your ems partners your fire partners to de to determine what should that protocol be and in what emergency that what type of an emergency that protocol gets activated so you get more of an appropriate response um, Second to that, if you can see the bottom right-hand corner, the ability to send messages. So your school administrators have a mutual link license, have the ability to text to 911 if you might be in a situation where you can't be on the phone and call to add additional information. You could take a, a, a picture of the suspect on the camera, text it directly to 911. You have the ability to access these cameras yourself as a school administrator to get more um, situational awareness around what's going on in the school. So when you hear law enforcement come over the radios as in Uvalde, they asked several times for the first 37 minutes of that situation whether or not students were even in the classroom. You know, as a school administrator, it'd be very easy to just come over the top of that and say, yes, students are still in the classroom. There's absolutely students in, in room 109, 111, 112. The door that you're trying to gain access to is a janitor closet. We don't have keys for that, but here, let me give you remote access to our door access control system so you can clear the building. It gives you the ability to get into those conversations. So you have visibility into what is holding up law enforcement, what is holding up fire, what is holding up EMS, and be able to get in there and get them the information they need. I think in um, one of the things that oftentimes we find people are shocked to learn is that when a situation like this unfolds, thousands of 911 calls start to come in. 
And a typical PSAP can only handle sometimes between 100 on a really good day with multiple dispatchers, 100 911 calls. And beyond that, they start to roll over into neighboring counties. So information about victims who might need assistance or um, additional suspect description information that might be coming from your most credible resources, which are your school administrators, your teachers, your students, your staff that are actually on site, may be getting rolled over to neighboring counties. And then that information doesn't actually get fed back into the system the way that it exists today. So by creating this common operating picture, it gives everybody the collaborative tools that they need. So you have a single stream of information and, um, and it allows public safety and school leaders to be able to work together for a coordinated response. Um, so Jeff, I thank you for that. I, I wanna um, pause and open it up and open it up for questions. We have about 18 or 19 minutes left. Um, we have some additional information we can cover on privacy and security. But you know, while Jeff has the demonstration up, um, is always a great opportunity to open it up for Q&A. And, um, and while we're waiting for maybe some questions to come into the chat box, I'd also like to call on uh, George Battle. So George, um, again, a retired corporal from Connecticut State Police, he handles all of our implementation. Um, so George, maybe you can touch on a little bit while we're waiting for some Q&A to come in on you know, the white glove service that we provide and really um, walking our customers through some of those exercises, tabletops, conversations that need to be had in order to develop the emergency protocols that we rely on in these situations to automate, automate the system. George? Yeah, sure, thank you, Chrissy. Um, what we really focus on, uh, I oversee education and training and we work very closely with our field operations team as they um, do surveys and facilitate the whole implementation of uh, the mutual link system. Certainly the onboarding process, we try to make as smooth as possible. Um, I, I think each of you had mentioned this to some extent before. We try to you know, really keep it rather simple. I, I, I like to focus on the, the five C's of mutual link, I call them. Certainly um, this common operating picture that we're looking to leverage these existing technologies as has been mentioned previously to facilitate that connection and that common operating picture um, for our stakeholders to be able to communicate and collaborate and coordinate as effectively as possible for any incident or event in your community. So, um, and and I, I also just wanna stress and, and during our training and onboarding process, um, we like to focus on the fact that I hope this is never utilized in an emergency situation, but equally as important, it can be utilized proactively for common events in your communities. So whether that is a, a, a festival or um, a, you know, a community gathering at one of your school facilities uh, or a sporting event or a commencement exercise, that is really the opportune time when you have some discretionary time to utilize the platform, become familiar with its functionality and uh, utilize it to the greatest extent possible. Then, um, and I hope it's not the case, but God forbid there's a critical incident in which this is utilized and the emergency response protocol is put into place in a critical incident. That system utilization and functionality is second nature. The muscle memory has, has you know, been gained previously and now under duress, folks can utilize the system rather seamlessly. It's, it's designed to be simplistic in its functionality, whether it's on a desktop or a laptop or a mobile device or in a mobile command post. Um, and again, we're really taking current investments, leveraging them to the greatest ex extent possible and uniting what would otherwise be disparate communication systems. Um, so, that's really the focus that we have. The training is uh, typically broken down into about two components. One, we work with designated system administrators to create end user credentials and facilitate um, uh, end users in our management user interface. And then the second phase of the training is focused on 
the end user application, what Jeff has demonstrated here, and how to go through the various aspects of the application. On its face, it looks sometimes a little complicated and intimidating. Once we work with our, our customers and, and we view ourselves as really a partner with the customers in each community that we work with. Um, and at the end of the day, the system really does, you know, four things. We're able to communicate through a couple of different audio paths, whether it's through your radio or through the application itself. You can share video from a mobile device, live streaming from your cell phone or through this floor plan layer and navigate through different cameras in a facility. As you mentioned, Chrissy, you have the ability to text message and share files. Um, and th that's really the, the focus of the end user experience. Under the hood, there's a lot of technology and complexities behind the scene that makes all of this come together. Um, but again, our focus is on the end user experience and ensuring that our customers and our community stakeholders are comfortable and confident in utilizing the application. George, thank you so much for that. Yeah. I think those are really key points when you talk about, you know, ease of implementation, you know, being able to bring a system like this together and online. I mean, we've done it in as, as fast as four weeks. We can do it, you know, and some folks have asked us, hey, it needs to fit into our roadmap. So can we draw that out for like 90 days? Sure, we can work within those confines as well. So we have a couple of questions that have come in. I think I'm going to pose this one. Um, Jeff Duran, since you have the system up, if you wouldn't mind, um, one of the questions is, um, well, it's twofold, right? One says, can you elaborate on the use of cell phones during the emergency? And then there's a second question, is if a teacher is in a room and hits the panic button, does her camera connect with police? So in this situation where you have your um, cell phone imaged up here, if this was a teacher's phone or administrator's phone or superintendent's phone, if you could walk us through how they would share maybe their camera directly with um, responding officers or 911. Thank you, Chrissy. And the concern over cell phones is valid. And no matter where you are in the United States, we're constantly concerned. And even our own personal lives, do we have signal, right? Does my cell phone work where I am right now? And this technology tries to make the best of it where we suggest wherever possible for users to be on FirstNet, or at least you should have pre-planned and know where your cell phone has connectivity. Yes, the system works over cellular, over 4G and 5G systems, but in addition, if you're in a campus, make sure you know how to connect to your campus's Wi-Fi system, because this system works very well over the broader capabilities of a Wi-Fi system. So every feature you saw here if enhanced by a Wi-Fi system, would be greatly enhanced. But reality is, if you're in an area of challenged signal or broadband connectivity, that doesn't only present a problem for technology solutions like Mutualink, but really anything you try to do in your mobile environment. So definitely from a planning perspective, know that environment, seek ways to improve it if you can. Question about video coming from individual devices. The Mutualink device and application certainly has the capability of transmitting video from inside its own application. And that video is instantly viewable by the 911 center or quite frankly, by anybody that is connected to the network and you can send live video from your phone. You may also send from your photo archive if necessary. You can actually go in and choose an image from your, uh, from your photo library and share that as well. Perhaps you took a picture of a suspicious person moments before, but they're no longer in view. You have the ability to, uh, in fact, select that image from the library and transmit it using the smartphone application. As far as turning on automatically, what we do have the ability to turn on automatically are fixed cameras like you see on the map here, because we know where they are, we know how to address them, and we can bring that in as part of our automated emergency response plan. The application from the phone would require an additional button push on the person uh, who wishes to transmit that video. But always you're going to take you're going to take inventory of your present situation. Are you protecting students? Are you hunkered down and in a safe place? And maybe uh, you are communicating. Now I might stress 
it's not absolutely necessary that teachers, faculty, and staff utilize this particular application. You may be just running a panic button application on your phone. There's many examples of that in the marketplace. We support all of them. Rave, Raptor, Crisis Go, Tap, Bap, Strategics. There's a lot of them out there. We have a partnership with every single one of those companies, and they work hand in hand with us to transmit those signals to the first responders. Not all of them support video, by the way, but to the extent that you've received some minimal training on the use of this application, you can very easily share video, even if you're holding it up over a desk or out into the hallway from the door of your classroom, yes, can be a very important part of what the first responders can see. Thanks for the question, Christian. No, that's great. And you bring up a very good point, Jeff, which is, you know, a lot of the schools that we go into where they've already invested in a panic button, right, because to be compliant with the law, it says they have to. A lot of their staff may already be trained on the use of that panic button. Maybe they've already downloaded it. Maybe it's a pendant around their neck. Maybe it's a hard panic button on the wall. Um, but it does give you, you know, our system gives you the ability to, to integrate directly with that, right? So we can still leverage that investment and give you the best solution um, while not disrupting and having to retrain all of your staff. So the next question, thank you, Jeff, for that. Um, the next question actually has to do with um, infrastructure and Wi-Fi, and um, you had mentioned FirstNet. Somebody asked, what is FirstNet? Um, and so we're going to start talking about this a little bit. I'm going to call on Greg here to add a little bit of color to this conversation. Um, but talking about infrastructure, um, you know, I I personally work a lot with our Arizona agencies, Arizona law enforcement and Arizona schools, a lot of the rural and tribal communities. We get these questions a lot. Some don't even have camera systems. So do I even need your system if I don't have cameras yet? Um, and so, so we navigate everything from the disparity of I have no technology to someday I want to have a dream system that, you know, has 200 cameras that I want to be able to have sensors and, and you know, all, vape sensors and all of these things that might need to be connected to it. Um, we have a lot of experience from, from one end of the spectrum all the way to the other. Um, and yes, we deal many times with these infrastructure questions where you might not have Wi-Fi, where broadband um, is disparate, right? And, and I think um, we'll call on Greg to talk a little about it a little bit is the ability to use our system to bring you know, your radio traffic into the cloud and leverage your LTE infrastructure. Or some schools sometimes will set up, um, you know, their, we'll call it a, a staff Wi-Fi that only staff phones can connect to versus allowing general public to connect to. But Greg, what's been your experience there in Texas, um, especially in these rural communities um, and some of the conversations you're having with school leaders there? Absolutely. So here specifically in Texas, there was a big push uh, to address that, the infrastructure for communication. So we have done a great job in Texas of, of pushing uh, broadband coverage, uh, the increased uh, coverage for LTE and, and, and cell phone reception, but uh, primarily for schools of, of creating networks for fiber internet communication and, and integration. So there's been a lot of money spent, uh, and not every area is has been reached. Uh, but for the most part, uh, in Texas, there's a lot of coverage for internet. So even if I don't have cell phone coverage, they've taken care of some of the schools, and and the schools have great Wi-Fi networks. And and like you're talking about, uh, there's two different networks: uh, guest students. Uh, and then faculty and staff are utilizing an entirely different uh, network. Uh, so that way they always have that connectivity for instructional purposes. But because of that, we can leverage the same system and give them direct communication. Uh, you know, we always talk about research-based or best practices, uh, but if we have that consistency across resources, that's an amazing tool and we can utilize that tool to protect our kids. And that's incredible. And, you know, we even have, you know, places in really rural Arizona where sometimes that tran that transport is over, you know, satellite backhaul if it needs to be. You say it's a disaster that we're, as public safety, responding to and not necessarily an active shooter situation. You know, having 
the flexibility to, you know, essentially connect whatever is still standing to be able to share information is a pretty powerful tool as well. Um, thank you for that, Greg. Um, this next question we're going to um, bring back to Jeff. I believe it's going to be our last question. Um, so we'll try to keep it quick because it looks like we're right at the top of the hour. Um, but back to Jeff Duran, since you have the system up one more time. Um, so if I'm a school administrator or school leader, or maybe the director of security for camp for a campus or multiple campuses, and maybe Joe Dooley might want to chime in on this as well. Um, but you know, the ability to also continue to manage the system on, on my end or manage the incident or the event on my end from that school leadership perspective, if I need to set up separate, you know, maybe a separate communications group for, you know, staff and student accountability, maybe uh, family reunification, maybe victim services, if you could walk us through that a little bit, Jeff Duran and maybe Joe Dooley. Yeah, that's a great question. So this is a multi-dimensional platform, meaning that although we started with this initial panic alert where we brought up one collaborative session that was labeled Capital One. In fact, from any operating position, everybody on the network is a peer, you can create additional rooms or collaboration sessions where you'll discipline yourself to only work on things that are of immediate concern to that particular group. This is important, of course, when there's mutual aid, when multiple agencies are responding, or even inside the school. Now, the important thing to note is as you create these individual uh, standalone groups like reunification or command post, uh, you decide who is a member of that collaborative session. It's not open to everyone. This is an invitation-based system, meaning you can, from a predefined list, bring certain individuals into that group who will conduct sidebar communications about the overall incident without interfering with the main incident where we're perhaps we're sharing video and radio communications. So that's a great question. We've taken that into consideration when we designed MutualLink to allow for this multi-collaborative event. As you see here, I just simply created a new incident. You can stack these on the screen and create as many disciplined communication sessions as need be. Chief, if you want to add anything. No, I, I think it's a great point. Um, it, it starts with the initial activation but some of these events can go on for uh, long periods of time. So uh, anyone that may be familiar with the incident command system, to be able to have multiple incidents, multiple groups, Chrissy said it best, there's you know, parent reunification centers that have to happen so that that group can talk in, in private networks. Um, the EMS side and just the logistics of evacuating people and bringing them to different areas the, the system is set up uh, basically on the incident command system on a national level that FEMA uh, has uh, had everyone trained in, as well as unified command for uh, all first responders and people who are responsible to manage the incident. Very, very robust platform. Chrissy, I, I would just add on to what uh, Joe and Jeff said that these talk groups can be set up proactively ahead of time also in what we call managed talk groups so that might be a group of um, either school administrators or law enforcement command staff or department heads from a particular community that can be in pre-arranged managed talk groups to communicate with each other on a daily basis and then in addition, if there's a critical incident in their community, they will be a part of that as well. So it, it, it can be done in a couple of different fashions. Yeah, I think that's really important, um, or really important points to make because those are a lot of the things I think that come out of those collaborative conversations and exercises that we run customers through with their partners and go, you know, what does this look like? How does your emergency ops plan address this? How can we get ahead of these things? And how much of that can we automate and, and pre-plan and set up so that we're prepared and not just compliant? So very good points, thank you. Christy, um, if I could add too, you know, we're talking about the unified command, incident command structure. <clears throat> Schools have been specifically required to participate in unified command. Uh, and then we saw in the Uvalde report where there was misinformation distributed from their public information officer and, and, and no fault of hers, because uh, I think she did a phenomenal job there. Uh, but now from a PIO perspective and unified command, I don't have to wait for that information to trickle back up to me. I can see it in real time and have exact information 
that I can then choose what needs to be distributed to my community. So from that unified command perspective, I think that's a great tool as well. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's those those are really good, um, really important points because when it comes back to the, where we're all getting at at the end of the day, is that the information that we get out to the families and the students and the staff um, is only going to be as good as the information that we have coming in. And so if we're not all communicating and on the same page and working towards the same goal, then you tend to find delays in response, inaction paralyzed public safety they just don't know what to do because they don't know where the emergency um where the what the emergency has even involved evolved into so all very good points um around bringing um, all of public safety and the schools together so that everybody's working towards that same mission so that um is going to conclude we're at the top of the hour so that is going to conclude our webinar today i want to thank everybody for joining us I, um, I want to touch on the funding piece for a second. We do have um, the funding guide that is attached to this webinar and will likely come to you via email afterwards. But please take a look at that. There's a number of grant opportunities to be able to fund this system um, comparably to other systems that might be like LMR systems, like this you know, significantly lower price point, especially for schools to obtain a system like this, because again, it's, it's more about integrating what you already have versus a big capital investment to try to, to get it into your schools. So please reach out to us. Um, feel free to reach out to Greg or Bonnie. Both their information will come across in your email. Um, there are our state of Texas team. And if any of the rest of us can be of any additional support to you, you have access to all of us. So feel free to reach out to us at the conclusion of this webinar with any additional questions that you might have. So to my panelists, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate the conversation. Audience members, thank you so much for staying with us, even though we're a few minutes over. And with that, we'll be done. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.